Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. And I want to invite you to open up God's Word to the book of Acts, chapter 19, the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 19. We are continuing today in our series through the book of Ephesians called Every Blessing in Christ. And the majority of our focus this morning will be on Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 in a message called The Spirit's Glorious Grace. But I've asked you to turn first to the book of Acts, chapter 19, to give us some background both on the topic this morning and some background on the relationship between the writer of this letter, the Apostle Paul, and the recipients of this letter, the saints at Ephesus. And the first seven verses of Acts chapter 19 give us some fascinating background into the first experience of some of the first believers there in the city of Ephesus. This took place on Paul's third missionary journey. And we are told in Acts 19, beginning in verse 1, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And what did he find in that city? There he found some disciples. Now, they are called disciples here because they are doing the best they could at this time with the information they had. But as we will find out, they were lacking at this time in their journey some vital information. Maybe you have found yourself at a place at times where you have been lacking some vital information. You were putting together that furniture from Ikea, right? And some assembly required, right? And and you're walking through and trying to studiously follow those steps and get all the right Allen wrenches and screws correct. And, And yet somewhere along the way, you have missed a step, just accidentally overlooked it. And now you're five more steps down the way, but you're like, why is this thing tilting? Why is it wobbly? Something has gone wrong here. And it's because you were lacking some vital information in that process. And you've got to undo it and go back to that information that you missed. Well, verse 2 shows us some of the vital information that these disciples were lacking. Paul said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed. And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul goes, wait, 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 okay then. (laughs) We need some clarification here, verse three. Into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul goes, ah, okay, I, I see what's going on here. Verse four, John baptized with the baptism of repentance but he was pointing ahead. He was telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. And so verse five tells us that on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, having come to understand that he is the promised Messiah and Savior. They went beyond what was foundational, Old Testament background, and the forerunner's ministry, and now they were able to fully embrace Jesus Christ and testify to that through their baptism. And notice what happens right away in verse six. Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Now we know that even at this time in the early church, not every believer experienced the speaking of tongues and the gift of prophesying. 1 Corinthians 12 makes that very, very clear. But in this case, all 12 of these men who were to have foundational roles in this church at Ephesus were gifted in this way. And the broader principle here is that as soon as they understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, believed in him, testified of that through their baptism, they instantly began experiencing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And this is so because of a promise that Jesus had made just several, a couple of years really, prior to this point. If you would turn back to the book of John chapter 14. The book of John, chapter 14. 
This was when Jesus was still ministering on earth and he is there in the upper room with his disciples. He is about to go to the cross for them, for us, and he is giving his disciples some vital instruction of what to expect when he is gone. And here he promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, then he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Now there is so much misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit even among professing Christians and a lot of failure to appreciate the Holy Spirit for who he truly is and what he does. And this scripture really gives us a lot of information in a nutshell to help us understand who the Spirit is. Notice how Jesus calls him in John 14, 16, another helper. The word there, another, meaning another of the same kind. He says, I'm stepping away, but the Father will send another just like me. So someone else who, like Jesus, is fully God, but who is also distinct from God. We understand who God is as Trinity, right? One in essence, three in persons, distinct in their working. And so Jesus says, I'm going to step away, but you're not going to lack anything because another just like me will come to be your helper. Now, this word in the ESV, helper, is the translation of a very rich Greek term called parakletos, or you might say paraclete. It simply means one who comes alongside of. That's what the word means. One who comes alongside of to assist, to help, to correct, to guide in any way that is needed. Yesterday, my wife planned a fall family day up at her parents' house north of Romeo, and and we had a wonderful time together experiencing all of these fall-themed activities. Now, the adults had fun, but it was really intended to mainly be for the kids, right, and to create some some uh, fall-seasoned core memories for them. And so we had a wonderful time with the kids playing all sorts of fall-themed games, bobbing for apples and, and ring, uh, pumpkin stem ring toss and pumpkin run and pumpkin bowling and my personal favorite, competitive donut eating. And we had a wonderful time together. And, and as I said, the adults enjoyed it, but it was really mostly for the kids. But at that very young age, they really needed some help in order to participate in the activities and to enjoy them to the fullest extent. Luckily for these three young ones, there were lots of adults adults around to come alongside them with any assistance that was needed. There were parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents who were happy to step in if there was something they didn't understand, if they didn't know the rules of the game or or how to do it well, or to even literally give them a hand with the ring toss or whatever it may be. The adults were happy to come alongside in any way to guide, to correct, to help. And such is the ministry of the promised Holy Spirit who comes alongside every single believer in Christ. And so now I want to ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, our primary text for the day, to see specifically how the Holy Spirit comes alongside at the moment of our salvation to seal and to secure our salvation forever. And together we will rejoice in the glorious grace of God the Spirit. First of all, today, point number one, we will see that the grace of God the Spirit is a saving grace. It is a saving grace. We understand, don't we, that salvation is of the Lord and each person of the Trinity plays their part in granting salvation. The Father planned it before the foundation of the world. The Son accomplished it 2,000 years ago on the cross and in his resurrection. But for 
each one of us individually, there must come a point in our lives when the Holy Spirit applies that salvation to us. What the Father has planned and what the Son has accomplished must be brought to us individually. And verse 13 shows us that that happens when we hear the word of God telling us the gospel and we respond in faith. See how this is described here in verse 13. In him, you also, Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. What a wonderful description here of salvation, conversion from the human point of view. Amen? From the human point of view, the receiving of salvation has the gospel at the center. Notice it right there in verse 13, the gospel of your salvation. And we know what gospel means, do we not? It means good news, not good advice. It's not good advice about what we should do. It is good news about what Jesus has done. And the wonderful thing that is emphasized here in verse 13 is that not only is it good news, but it is true news. It comes from the word of truth. Boy, truth is so refreshing, is it not? Especially in an age of misinformation and disinformation. We thought that here in this information age, naively, that more people having more access to put more information out there would lead to more and better understanding. Ha! Human sin was not factored into the equation. And yes, there is truth that can be found out there, but it is mingled with a lot of half-truths and misdirection and outright falsehood, regardless of the source that you're getting it from, whether it's mainstream media, plenty of lies wrapped up there, but alternative media as well. You can't know all the time which sources are to be trusted and all the things that are thrown out there on social media. You see a video as you're scrolling your feed and you're like, oh, that sounds Sounds good, but is it true? So difficult in these days to sort through the truth and the lies. And we have in this book the word of truth. And it is the word of truth because it is the word of God, and God is truth. And so 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is breathed out by God. And because God knows all and because God cannot lie, every word of this is true, including the parts that contain for us the good news, the gospel of what Jesus did for our salvation. It is true. You can stake your life on it. You can stake your eternal life on it. And through this word of truth, verse 13 says, we are saved. We are born again. We are given new life, salvation. James 1.18 says, of his own will, he brought us forth. How? By the word of truth. It is the word of God that brings forth new spiritual life. Just as all the way back in the beginning, Genesis 1, God spoke and life came into being. So with each one of us at the moment of our salvation, God speaks through his word. And when that is met with faith, new life produces forth. And we owe all of this to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because without the Holy Spirit, we would not have the word of God, nor would we understand the word of God. This too is based on the promise that Jesus gave in John 14, verse 26. Continuing in this information about the helper, the Holy Spirit, he tells his disciples that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, why was this important? Because the disciples were ordinary men 
They were not selected because they were exceptionally bright or discerning. And all throughout their time with Jesus during his earthly ministry again and again and again, they were misunderstanding what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was doing, what Jesus was indicating, what his plan was as it unfolded. Continually they misunderstood. And yet it was supposed to be through the teaching of these men that the church of Jesus Christ was established? How could this be? How did these men preach with such clarity in the book of Acts? How did these men go on to write such inerrant authoritative scripture for the church? How could this be? Through the teaching ministry of the Spirit. Jesus said, the Spirit will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you, the result of which we have in the four New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus said the Spirit will teach you all things, the result of which would be the New Testament epistles written by the apostles and their associates. And then later in John 16, verse 13, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will declare to you the things that are to come. And so we have the book of Revelation. In other words, the entire New Testament is based on this promise of Jesus regarding the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Here's the point. If you are ever tempted to think that the Holy Spirit is kind of the unimportant person of the Trinity, just remember that everything the Father planned and everything the Son accomplished would matter nothing to you if it were not for the Holy Spirit in scripturating these truths in the Bible and illuminating your heart to understand and believe. And so we glorify the Holy Spirit for his work in our salvation, our conversion. But understand that from the human perspective, this moment of conversion doesn't feel like a divine zap. From the human point of view, there are people involved. See, verse 13 says, when you heard the word of truth, and how do you hear the word of truth? Well, in some cases, a few cases, it may be that you have just stumbled upon a Bible, maybe in the drawer of your hotel room, and just started reading it, and you were saved. That is most certainly possible. Or maybe you were handed a a gospel tract, and nobody talked to you. They just gave you something to read, and you read through, and saw the scripture, and you were saved. But most often, the word of truth comes to you through the proclamation of a believer. This had happened in the lives of the Ephesians through the ministry of Paul. Acts 19 verse 10 tells us that Paul was there in Ephesus for two years, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus, so that as a result, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Why? Because Paul understood that humans, Christians, are meant to be the agents to bring the word of truth, the gospel of salvation to people, so that they may believe. Paul wrote elsewhere in Romans 10, 14, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? A Christian is the one who is intended to bring the word of truth, the gospel of salvation to those who have not heard so that more people may believe. In other words, words are necessary. When I come to phrases like this in scripture, I'm always reminded of one of the dumbest quotes, not from the Bible, but one of the dumbest quotes that gets passed around in Christian circles. And that is the quote, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Well, I'm here to tell you that they're necessary. Like in every single case, okay? Someone once said, that's like saying, feed the hungry, use food if necessary. Yeah, it's kind of necessary. And to preach the gospel, words are necessary. Now, I understand the intent of that statement is to say that your life should back up the message that you are preaching. And I get that. Like, hypocrisy is a big problem. But there are other ways to address hypocrisy without using this quote that implies that you can preach the gospel without using words. No, words are necessary. 
It is when people hear the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, that they can then believe in that message, the good news of what Jesus has done. And of course, it's important for us to understand as well what it means biblically to believe in Christ, as verse 13 says. It is more than merely having the right information. And in fact, it is more than merely believing that right information to be accurate. Even the demons believe, they tremble. They're not redeemed. And I tremble at the thought of people having the right information about Jesus and even believing it to be true, but failing to trust, to rely, to rest the weight of their soul for eternity on Christ and Christ alone. Because that is what it means to believe, to trust in Jesus. It means that we are no longer seeking to win God's favor through our own efforts or accomplishments, but rather we drop everything that we were previously trusting in for our salvation and we rest fully in what Jesus has done. And the proof of our belief is in the actual resting on Christ, not just having the right information about him or even claiming that we believe it to be true, but resting in it. This stage that I am standing on today is reliable. I have no doubt that it will bear my weight. In fact, it can bear the weight of a lot of people up here on the platform. It is a good, well-constructed stage. It creaks a little bit sometimes, but it's a really good, well-constructed stage. I'm 100% sure that I will not crash through it. But if I were saying all these things to you while standing on the floor here, you might say to me, well, if you truly believe that it can bear your weight, why don't you stand on the stage? And if I were to say to you, well, you know, I'm I mean, I really believe that it can, but, you know, just in case, let's not take any chances that, that maybe, just maybe, I will fall through. You would say, well, you don't believe at all that that stage can bear your weight. It is only in the actual standing on the stage and resting the weight of my being upon it that I am relying, that I am believing fully in what this stage can do. And it is in the resting of your life and eternity upon Jesus and Jesus alone. That is faith, biblically speaking. It's what separates you from the demons who believe and tremble because you are fully relying on Jesus' work in his perfect life and his substitutionary death and his victorious glorious resurrection, and it is only in that that you are resting your faith for eternity. And if you're here today, and you are not trusting, not relying in Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation, the good news is that this moment is an opportunity for you to do just that. God knows your every thoughts, and you can pray to him right there in your seat in this moment and trust in him for your salvation. Acknowledge your need to him, that you have sinned, you have fallen short of the glory of God in so many ways. But thank him for sending his son Jesus to live that perfect life that we have failed to live, to die on the cross in our place for our forgiveness, and to rise from the grave to give us eternal life. Rest in him. Trust in him. And you, my friend, will be saved. Because John 1, 12 through 13 says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And so we, first today, we see that the glorious grace of the Spirit is a saving grace. Secondly, today, we will see that the glorious grace of the Spirit is a sealing grace, a sealing grace. This we will see as verse 13 continues and into verse 14 Paul writes, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, what happened? 
you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now there are a couple of metaphors, images given here in these verses to emphasize the keeping work of the Holy Spirit. The first one here at the end of verse 13 is that mention of being sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. This is a reference to an ancient practice wherein kings would take their signet ring or some other stamp bearing their crest and press it into hot wax so that as that wax cools, it will permanently bear the authoritative mark of the king. In fact, we can put up here on the screen for you uh, one such example of an ancient seal. You can see there it was nothing but a blob of wax until the king's signet ring met it and now you see his symbol and now forever this piece will bear the image of the king. It signified ownership, the king's seal, that this thing sealed by me is mine and forever will be. It reminds me of a story I heard of a kid's birthday party. I don't know if this actually happened or if it's just a story, but there was one particular kid there at the birthday party who was eyeing the birthday cake, and he was really a big fan of birthday cake, and he determined what the largest slice of birthday cake was and he decided he was going to claim that slice for his own. And he took his little grubby finger and he stuck his finger right in that largest birthday cake slice and said, this one here is mine. Pretty effective way to claim a slice of birthday cake, right? Who wants to eat a slice of birthday cake with someone else's grubby finger marks in it? However, this friend didn't allow for the cleverness of his other friends there at the party, who each one of them walked up to that same slice of cake and stuck their fingers in it and said, yes, this one is his. Yes, this one is definitely his slice. Yes, this one is his, and he is sure going to enjoy it with all of these other finger marks in it. Now, that little kid's plan didn't really work out the way that he had hoped, but it was an attempt to stamp that thing with ownership. And in the case of an ancient king, no one was going to mess with his stamp of ownership. It was his claim which could not be changed, not even if he were to change his mind. You can actually see examples of this in Old Testament scripture, probably the most notable example being the story of Daniel and the lion's den. At that time, the king was King Darius. Daniel was one of his highest officials. He was a man of integrity. The king really valued that in him. However, the other officials were very jealous of Daniel and purposed to take him down. And they knew that they weren't going to be able to expose him for any actual sin or wrongdoing. And so they contrived to come up with a policy with, that would affect his faith and his practice. See, they knew that Daniel prayed three times times a day toward Jerusalem, toward his God, and they tricked the king into signing an edict that would not allow people for the next 30 days to pray to anyone except to that king. The king naively signed it, stamped it, it took effect, and Daniel went on doing what he always did, three times praying to his God. And the officials, the other officials had him. And they came to the king and they said, King, guess what? Bad news. Your guy, Daniel, he broke your edict. The king realized he had been duped, but what could he do? It had already been enacted. It had been stamped. It could not be changed. In fact, Daniel 6.17 tells us that after Daniel was placed into the lion's den, a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king had to seal it with his own signet that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Even the mightiest ruler in that land was not at liberty to alter things once they had been sealed. And he was left to simply pray to Daniel's God that Daniel's God would rescue him 
which he did, by the way. Great story. You should check it out sometime. But my point is the sealing activity of a king cannot be changed. That ownership of the king over what is sealed is permanent. And so it is with you and I at the moment of our conversion, not later, not once we start growing in Christ and bearing fruit and using our gifts and really proving to the people around us that we deserve to belong. No, at the moment of our conversion, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are made his own and that will not change. Now, it's important for us to understand this particular ministry of the Spirit in contrast with other ministries of the Spirit which we do engage with. In fact, later on in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, we will be commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning that we are supposed to give ourselves to his control day by day, moment by moment, allowing him and his word to guide us along through our our lives. That is something we participate in. That is something moment by moment we can either do or fail to do as we allow ourselves to be controlled by other influences. But in contrast to the filling work of the Holy Spirit, the sealing work of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with our participation. It is his work and it is permanent. And this image of sealing corresponds with the next image that we find in verse 14, where we are told that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. Now, we talked a lot last week about our inheritance in Christ, right? The riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. The Holy Spirit guarantees this inheritance. Now, the word translated guarantee is based on a Greek term, arabon, which simply means a deposit or a down payment. We all understand how those things work, right? If you're going to participate in an event and they ask for a non-refundable deposit, you pay part of the money with the guarantee that more will come later. Or if you own a house, most likely you had to put down a down payment that would be part of the whole mortgage agreement that yes, eventually you will pay all the money and here is a portion of it up front to guarantee the rest that is to come. At times, this kind of arabon, this kind of deposit or guarantee could be an object. I think in our day, probably the object that would come to mind in terms of a deposit might be an engagement ring, right? Where, where, where you agree with someone else to marry them and there is a token then that the man will give to his fiance to say, hey, here's a ring and, and by the way, you'll be able to keep this but more will be added to this. After some number of months you'll be able to put a wedding band next to it and then a whole lifetime of marriage on top of all that all and uh, on top of all that and this is a deposit a guarantee of more to come now in our case we can only do so much to guarantee something Why? Because despite our best intentions, we might have to back out of that event that we laid down a deposit for. We might have to break a mortgage if we lose our job and can't find any way of continuing to make those payments. Even in the case of an an engagement, sometimes that will not continue for one reason or another. But when God puts down the deposit, he has the ability to follow through in every case. And don't miss this here in verse 14. The deposit is God himself. What does verse 14 say is the guarantee? Or I should say, who does verse 14 say is the guarantee? The Holy Spirit himself is the deposit. He himself is the down payment. He himself is what we have now with the guarantee of more to come. How amazing is this? No, we are not in heaven yet but we do have the God of heaven in us. It's why we sing, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, because God has already given himself to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. To use a very, very imperfect analogy, because every analogy of the Trinity falls short in some way, but if we could compare God the Father to the sun, S-U-N, the sun in the sky, him being the source, 
him being the, the foundation of all the light and energy and warmth that, that emanates, but himself being unapproachable, right? Like you're not even supposed to look at the sun directly because that's just how bright it is. If the Father is like that Son, then the Son, S-O-N, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God, Hebrews 1, verse 3. He is the one who brings the light of the Son to us in such a way so as to make the effect of the Son visible. But I think we might also think of the Holy Spirit as the one who brings the light and the warmth of the Son to each one of us personally. That though the S-U-N sun is unapproachable, the effect of that sun does reach our lives in a very personal and noticeable way. The third person of the Trinity right now, he is in us, he is among us, and that guarantees more to come. Because see, as verse 14 says, this inheritance, this rich inheritance, this lavish inheritance, we have not yet acquired full possession of it. He says, until we acquire possession of it. There are benefits of our salvation that we are not yet enjoying. We still struggle against sin. We still endure the pressures of this world and the harassments of Satan. We still live in bodies that get sick and injured and get bald and someday will die and decompose. Paul put it this way and used a different analogy in Romans 8.23 that we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit still grown inwardly because we are still waiting for full adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. In Ephesians 1, Paul uses the metaphor of a deposit. In Romans 8, he uses the metaphor of the first fruits of a crop. We anticipate much more to come, but when those first fruits show up, you say, aha, it's happening this year. Hasn't fully happened yet, but it is guaranteed through these first fruits. Whenever it gets warm in the spring, I love walking to the back of our property uh, with my boys to see if the raspberry and blackberry branches have begun to produce. They've been there a long time. They were planted before we moved into our house almost 10 years ago, and they are wild. They are not cultivated at all, but every year they produce these little raspberries, these little blackberries, and they are delicious. And it's always exciting when we walk back there and we can see the first fruits of that crop and grab those little red things and those little black things and pop them into our mouths and enjoy those first fruits. Now we can see that there is more on those thorny branches, more that have still barely begun to bud and you can't eat them yet, but you can see that you will be able to enjoy the full crop that is to come and that is guaranteed through those first fruits fruits. So it is with the Holy Spirit. We enjoy initial benefits of salvation through him, and that guarantees there is more to come. Now think about the glories of what it is that we already experience with the benefits of our salvation, even though they are not yet complete. Think back to when the eyes of your heart were opened to see the glory of Jesus and believe in the gospel of Jesus. That was the Holy Spirit. When you experience that relief of forgiveness of sins, when you experience the assurance of eternal life, that was the Holy Spirit. When you discover new treasures of truth in this book, that is the Holy Spirit. When you sing these rich truths in awestruck wonder, surrounded by redeemed brothers and sisters in Christ, all lifting their voices in that glorious moment of praise, that is the Holy Spirit. When you find yourself losing a taste for sin and you begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness instead, that is the Holy Spirit. When you experience the joy and satisfaction of using your gifting to bless someone else, that is the Holy Spirit. Now, if all of that is just the deposit, just the first fruits of the crop, imagine the abundance that is to come when we are with the Father and Son and Spirit forever in glory. What a rich and lavish inheritance that that will be. 
but we do await this full inheritance. We have not yet received our resurrection bodies. We are not yet housed in our heavenly mansions. We do not yet see Jesus face to face, but we will. How do we know? Because God the Spirit has already been given to us. We have the non-refundable deposit, and he will not fail to give us the rest. These verses, of course, are wonderful verses that impact our understanding of the biblical doctrine of eternal security, a vital doctrine for Christians to know and to understand. That once a person is truly saved, they cannot lose their salvation. They always will be saved. Now, that is not to say that there are not those who are faking it, who are false believers, who were never genuinely saved to begin with, but act like they are for a time until eventually they are exposed. The New Testament has a lot to say about fake believers. But once you are truly saved by the power of God, you always will be. And how could it be otherwise? It was the Father who initiated your salvation, the Son who earned your salvation, the Spirit who seals your salvation. How could you lose it? We say, well, Pastor Mike, I, I worry about this sometimes. What if I mess things up? My friend, you weren't saved because of your competence and you won't be lost because of your incompetence. You say, well, Pastor Mike, what if I don't measure up? My friend, you weren't saved because of your goodness and you won't be lost because of your badness. You say, well, what if my circumstances change? I mean, life is long and stuff happens and I feel like I'm saved now and genuine now, but what if decades down the road, the circumstances are different? My friend, you weren't saved because of your circumstances and you won't be lost because of them. Salvation is of the Lord. It is all his grace. And when God makes a promise, he keeps it. And if he promises to save to the uttermost those who come to him through Christ, he will follow through on that promise. He's very good at keeping his promises even to very imperfect people. My mind goes back to Genesis 12 and God's promise to Abram, seemingly random. Abram, this pagan guy living in a pagan land, and God comes to him out of nowhere and says, I'm going to bless you, Abram. And not only that, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we understand that to be a promise that the Messiah will come through his line. And God kept that promise despite all kinds of human failings. Abraham himself was prone to fear of man, which led him to lie on more than one occasion in order to try to save his skin through his own efforts and ingenuity. And then there was the point where he and his wife Sarah said, hey, we're too old to have this promised baby. And so Abram, why don't you take my servant Hagar? And we all know how poorly that all turned out and how unneeded it was. But despite that lack of faith and faithfulness, God held strong to his promise. That promised son Isaac had the weakness of blindness to where he was able to be duped by his own son. And yet despite that weakness, God kept his promise. Jacob, what a scoundrel he was. What an appropriate name. Jacob, supplanter. He was shady in almost all of his dealings. And yet despite this weakness, God kept his promise promise. Jacob's sons, what a mess they were. So many faults, so many failings, scandal after scandal after scandal in this family. They took their own younger brother, Joseph, wanted to kill him, ended up selling him into slavery. What a mess. But despite all of this, God kept his promise. Because when he makes a promise, he keeps it not because of our faithfulness, but despite our failings and our weaknesses. Now, don't misunderstand. There are ethical implications to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Please don't hear me as saying that it doesn't matter whether you grow in your faith or obey the Lord. It matters a great deal. 
And part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to lead us in this. And in fact, the entire second half of Ephesians, chapter 4 through through 6, will be all about how to walk out this gospel that we have believed. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. There are ethical implications and commands for Christians. I do believe that those who are preserved by God will persevere in their faith and in their growth by the power of the Holy Spirit. But please understand that when it comes to eternal security, eternal security is not based on our ability to keep holding on to God, but it is based on God's ability to keep holding on to us. I think some of us may need to hear that a second time. Eternal security is not based on your ability to keep holding on to God, but rather is based on his ability to keep holding on to you. Don't take my word for it. Hear the voice of your good shepherd in John chapter 10. My sheep, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And so Paul was able to write with confidence to the believers in Philippi, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's why he wrote to the church at Rome, chapter 8, verse 30, those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. In other words, he does not lose a single one from beginning to end. So what shall we say to these things? God is for us. Who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now how can we respond to these things but to praise his glorious grace? So rather than preaching this last phrase, we are going to act it out by standing together and lifting up our voices and in song declaring the glorious truths of Ephesians 1. Just look what God has done. The Father has adopted us. The Son has redeemed us. The Spirit is guarding us. So let's praise the Lord for his glorious grace.